Uh, we're going to continue in the series called The Arrival. And uh, we're going to start off where we left off last week. So we ended in verse 11 of Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Not COVID, everybody, just uh, <laughs> second service preaching. Um, so uh, we're going to start off with verse 11 of Luke chapter 2. And uh, we're just going to read a couple verses and we're going to dive in with what the Lord has for us today. So Luke chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says this. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Someone shout Savior. Savior. Who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe. Somebody say babe. A babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly, now someone shout suddenly. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The arrival of Jesus meant the arrival of peace. Has anybody at any time in your life ever needed peace? Can I get a raise of a hand? <laughs> I've needed a piece of pie, a piece of pizza pie, a piece of cake. But at some point, some way, we all need peace in our lives. And Jesus, his arrival meant peace to the entire world. And so my goal today is this one simple thing, is that every one of us will be able to walk out of here knowing how to walk in the peace, peace with God and the peace of God. And so in order for us to figure this out and know how to do this, we have to really help you to know, I want to let you know what peace is not. And uh, I, I was kind of thinking about, well, what, what is peace? What is peace not? And one thing that peace is not, is not the, something that hippies brought in the 60s. <laughs> That's not real peace. Say, so, yeah, man. Everybody give me a peace sign like this. Like that, that is, that is not peace. Uh, but I think that we think that's peace. Uh, we think that that's what Jesus, sometimes I think that some people think that Jesus has dreadlocks and a tie-dye t-shirt. And, and that's kind of the feeling that you're going to get when you get to know the real Jesus, man. But that's actually not, that's not what peace is. Peace is not that movement that was started in the 1960s. And can someone say thank God for that? Peace is not the absence of war. Peace is not the absence of war. The Apostle Paul says that my, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. And so the flesh meaning uh, that part of us, that sinful nature. And so Paul the Apostle who had plenty of peace, he said the spirit wrestles against the flesh and the flesh wrestles against the spirit. And so if you're struggling today, if you're having a hard time with your flesh, has anybody had a hard time with their flesh before? Anybody ever say the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong way? <laughs> Husbands, put your hand right up. <laughs> If that's you, listen to me. Just because you struggle doesn't mean you have to not have peace. Uh, the reality is, is I think that we lose peace when we stop the struggle. What I mean by that is when we give in and we give up and we just give into the flesh, I think that's when a flood of, uh, of the lack of peace will come into our lives. Because you're not, listen, you're not defeated until you give up. As long as you're struggling, I want to tell you that you're on your way to victory. Don't quit struggling. Keep, on, keep up the good fight of faith in Jesus' name. See, the absence of war does not bring peace. The Apostle Paul, he faced literal persecution, people wanting to kill him for his faith. Yet, the Apostle Paul was able to have peace. Uh, peace is not the result of being religious or a good person. All the good people should be very disappointed right now. <laughs> but peace does not come from being religious and, and being a good person. Good deeds and kindness w without Christ will lead to depletion. Good, good deeds and kindness without Jesus will leave you depleted. It will leave you empty. It will leave you discouraged. Why? Because a lot of times the things that, the reason that we're motivated to do these things, we think that it's going to do something good for our soul, for the inner being. And the reality is, is no, it'll make you feel good for a season, but at the, after a while, that season will be up and you'll be left just as empty and depleted as you ever were before. And so doing these things, being religious, doing the right thing, 
I, I said to the nine o'clock service, so I won't say to this service, but I said to the nine o'clock service, you can help all the little puppies that you want to help, but that's not going to bring you peace. You can, you can do all the good humanitarian things that you want to do, but it won't, will, it'll make you feel good for a moment, but it will not lead to long lasting peace. For some reason, I just ha I have a, I have a cartoon picture in my head. Uh, Zootopia. <laughs> Who's watched Zootopia before? Yeah. All right, homework from the from the pastor is after this service, you have to go home and watch Zootopia. And so there's a character in Zootopia who like has dreadlocks and he talks like this man, like I don't know, like I don't remember anything. Do you know what? I'm am I, are you catching it? And, and, and it? and I got this. That's what people think peace is. The way that that guy walks around with a certain attitude and a certain vibe to him. And so what, I mean, that's so stupid and so sillery. Sil, sillery. <laughs> Lord knows I should have drank more coffee before preaching. That, that's, that's really silly. However, I think that inside people's hearts and minds, they're pursuing that thinking that that, that is going to lead them to peace. Well, what does that, do? man, it, it causes us to seek substances rather than something of substance. Ooh. It, it causes us to go to the bottle. It causes us to go to uh, different uh, medicines and things, trying to seek peace. And though, listen, I, I'm thankful for doctors. I know quite a few doctors, and I'm thankful for their expertise. But I'll tell you this, peace is never found in a pill. It's never found in capsule form or liquid form. It's never found in a needle. It's not found in a bottle. There's absolutely nothing that you can take of substance by putting it in your body that's going to lead to peace. All that it does is it masks your need for peace. It'll numb you. It'll, it'll, it'll blind you for a It will distract you enough so, so that you don't perceive the need for peace. But at some point, as we all know, anybody that's done anything knows that that high wears off after a while. And you recognize that, it, that what once was enough is now never enough. And so you just have to start doing more and more and more. And what's really going on is you have people that are trying to self-medicate the lack of peace away when there's only one cure for that, and his name is Jesus. Yeah. D.L. Moody said this about peace. Peace is not something you can make. Oh, I'm going to make peace, or I'm, I'm going to make peace. The, the, it's wonderful to make amends. There's nothing wrong with that. But the concept of making peace, D.L. Moody said this, a great many people are trying to make peace, but that has already been done. God has not left it for us to do. All we have to do is enter into it. So peace is not something that you and I can make. But it, what is peace? Peace is something that he can make. Somebody say, he makes it. Yes. Peace is something that God makes. Uh, the Bible, the word for peace in the Bible uh, is the word Irene. It's where we get the word serene from. And this is the biblical definition of peace. It means to join or bind together that which has been broken, divided, or separated. This is what a biblical peace is, to bring together or bind together that which has been broken, uh, divided, or separated. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, somebody say faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. So what are we supposed to do with that? You know, that, that means if we want to experience peace, real peace, then we have to rid ourselves of self-righteousness and go to the only one who actually is righteous. See, all those things that I just prescribed or described to you uh, really are, are people's attempts at gaining peace on their own by, by doing things and, 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 and trying to manipulate the situation. When the rea Here's the reality. The only way to get peace is to go after Jesus. So what is peace? Peace is something that he makes. And if you want it, we need to go to him. Is there anybody that wants some peace today? I'm not talking about peace and quiet. <laughs> that, that's up to you and your home, however you figure that out. I'm talking about a real peace that in the midst of all chaos and loudness and, and stuff going on around you, you can experience this kind of peace. Peace is having it all together. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I have it all together. <laughs> now look at your other neighbor and say, hey, I just lied to that neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> 
Listen, having it, but that is what peace is. Peace is having it all together. But here's the reality. Having it all together, uh, it, it doesn't mean that you're holding it all together. It's recognizing and knowing that there's a God who has the power to hold it all together. Amen. See, there's a difference between, the peace w- between peace with God and the peace of God. You can have peace with God without having the peace of God. See, peace with God is knowing that my final breath on this earth will be my, fir- my, my next breath in heaven. It's knowing that there's nothing between me and my God. It's knowing that having peace with God means that you have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. It means that if you've confessed your sins, it means you've given the, the reins of your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, you are now heaven bound and not hell bound. That's what peace with God means. But you can have that kind of peace and lack pe- the peace of God. The peace of God is something completely different. The peace of God is found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing. Someone say amen to that. (laughs) Be anxious for nothing except for those who haven't done their Christmas shopping yet. There's a reason to be anxious. No, the Bible does not say that. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In other words, this kind of peace requires you and me to relinquish control. And you you may not know this or be aware of this, but I'm looking at a bunch of control freaks. (laughs) <laughs> They're right in front of me. I'm looking at you, and you're looking at me. And uh, you're, trying to ho- you're trying to control. Oh, move on from this point, please. But I'm going to control the situation. Now I'm going to move into this point even more. Is We have a control problem. And if we want to exper- experience the peace that surpasses all understanding, then we need to learn to give up our, our controls to the God who is in control. Amen? Amen. I-, I love the passage. Uh, it- if you do this, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. You know, I love the fact and I also resent the fact that God gave us a free will. If it wasn't for that free will thing, then God would just be in control of our lives. Now, here's the deal. God is in control, but he's not controlling. And there's a huge difference. God's in control of situations. God is sovereign. His sovereign plan is going to take place on this earth. The question is, are you going to be a part of that sovereign plan? He's, he's in control, but he's not controlling. He's a good father. And so today, uh, and, and here's the thing I think, is why we don't give relinquish control to God. Because we don't trust him. And that's not like, you loser, you don't trust God. <laughs> that's like, hey, as a pastor, I'm standing up here and saying, you know, sometimes it can be kind of hard to relinquish control to God. Because sometimes we don't exactly know how God is going to handle what it is that we relinquish control to him. We don't know how he's going to handle it. We don't necessarily, we know his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We know he's a good God. However, sometimes we're just like a stubborn donkey. (laughs) And it's like, okay, I got the, you know, we say it without saying it. I've got this God. I want to challenge each and every one of us in this room today and online is how about you try during this Christmas season just relinquishing control to the Lord? Uh, I don't know what the average age in this room is, but I would venture to guess that, that, that you know, over the past 25, 35, 45 years of your life, uh, hanging on to control probably hasn't made the best outcome for you. <laughs> However, I would say for those who have experienced and tried relinquishing control to God, you've experienced, wow, It works when God is in in control. And so for this Christmas season, I would just encourage, implore, challenge you to give control over to God. All right, talk about what the Holy, what, what, what peace is. Peace is supernatural. Somebody say supernatural. Peace is supernatural. Worship team, if you'd come on up, because something supernatural is going to happen today. A supernaturally short message. (laughs) Because I, I want us to pray, and, and I want us to just kind of, yeah, God's going to do something great. Amen. Amen? Amen? Peace is supernatural. Amen. 
The Bible says that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace. So what does that teach us? That shows us that peace is actually something that cannot be produced in and of ourselves. We can't just wake up, oh, I'm just going to muster up peace today. Peace is something that has to be developed and produced in us by the Holy Spirit. So it's supernatural. Someone say supernatural. It's supernatural. But then the Bible says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting, somebody say letting. Letting. letting the Holy Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Did you get that? It's kind of like the same point, like, hey, give control to the Holy Spirit. Give control to God. Uh, but letting the Holy Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So if we want to experience supernatural peace in our lives, we have to experience the supernatural Holy Spirit. I want us to pay attention today because here, this is the how-to. of Because I think every person wants peace in their life. We all want to experience peace. Number one, where does it begin? Where does it start? It starts with a right relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Peace. There is no peace without presence. There is no peace without presence. So, and I'm not talking about the gift just yet. <laughs> If we want to experience the peace of God, we have to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So often, and, and this is why, just follow me, this is why so many believers have peace with God. Like, oh, man, I'm going to heaven. If I, if I die today, I'm going to heaven. Yet at the same time, so many believers lack the peace of God. Is because sometimes we ignore, we absolutely ignore the third person in the Trinity who is the Holy Spirit. You know, imagine if you had a present for somebody and, and you went to them and say, hey, here's this gift. I thought of you and I have this gift for you. Here, here's this wonderful gift. And, and, then, and then you're like, you don't have a gift in your hands. What are you talking about? Like that would, that would make you feel a little bit put off and a little bit strange. Man, we do that to the Holy Spirit. And so here, here's the challenge for us today. There, I don't think there's anything wrong with pursuing peace. I think there's a biblical uh, argument to pursue peace especially peace with other people. But the type of peace, peace of the peace of God, if you want to experience that, we have to pursue the Holy Spirit. So how do you do that? I think number one, having right relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise. That's not just a good suggestion. That is an absolute promise from the Bible. The second thing that we need to do is we need to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit. If this is like your first time in church today, you're like, what is he talking about? Just hang in there. Like, th I, I trust that by the help of the Holy Spirit, this is all going to make sense to you. Because there's just some things like you just can't, you just got to trust God to help. For those who have been serving God to, for, for a long time, I just want to encourage you today. It's time to start pursuing the Holy Spirit. Maybe stop pursuing peace. Maybe stop pursuing this, pursuing joy, pursuing love, joy, peace, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and start pursuing the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? It happens through acknowledging His presence. Simply during prayer time, saying, Holy Spirit, I acknowledge your presence on the inside of me. The second thing to do if we're going to pursue the Holy Spirit, don't reject his gifts. Don't reject. Listen, the Holy Spirit, he has all kinds of gifts for you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Bible calls them. Don't reject them. Receive them. Pursue them. Seek after the, the gift that God has for you. When you're, and I'm not just meaning in like a church service. I mean like when you're at the grocery store and the Holy Spirit puts on your heart and your mind, he's starting to speak to you. Like buy that person's groceries. Like listen to that voice. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Pursue the Holy Spirit. Listen to his voice. Obey his promptings. Do good. Listen, I'll help you. Whenever there's something, something placed in your heart to do good to someone else, I guarantee you it's not the devil. <laughs> Especially if you don't like that person. <laughs> like I could, well, is that, you don't have to say, hmm, is that the Holy Spirit or not? Now, if the whole, if you think, slash that person's tires, and you're like, hmm, is that the Holy Spirit or not? <laughs> I could probably help you, it's probably not. Like, but what if God wants to protect them and not have them drive down the road? Then probably just telling them that. <laughs> like, anyway. 
If my tires are slashed after this service, I'll know what happened. <laughs> Pursue the Holy Spirit this, in this season. As we, the best thing that you and I can do is pursue the Holy Spirit. Another really key thing to do that I, that I personally, lo- that I think is such a huge, ha- has had such a huge impact on my faith and on my growth is the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Just reading your faces because there's all kinds of views on that issue. Pursue the Holy Spirit. Allow him to fill you up. The Bible says, be ye continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we're like leaky vessels. We're leaky people. (laughs) We've got holes in us. And so God can fill us up and pour into us one day. But just because you're filled up on Sunday doesn't mean you're going to be filled up on Monday. Why? Because you're holy. So so you can tell your neighbor when he calls you a jerk, I'm not a jerk, I'm holy. I, the, no statement could have ever been more true. You are a holy being. You are a holy, a holy person. It is true. You're holy, and holy things leak. Continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we have to sit in a place of peace. If you'll throw that last point up on the board. I needed you to do that because I can't remember what my last point. Choose from a place of peace. This is why it's so important to pursue the Holy Spirit and have peace because we need to choose. We need to learn to make decisions from a place of peace. See, that's why the enemy fights us and that's why the enemy comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. One of those things he comes to steal, kill, and destroy is our peace. Because the best place for you and I to make decisions, whether it's our finances, our marriage, our kids, our job situation, whatever it is, you name it, the best place to make those decisions is from a position of peace. Why? Because when we're walking in peace, we're walking with, the clar- with clarity. We're walking in the wisdom of God. When we have absolute peace, we're not making an emotional decision. We're, we're making a very logical, God-led type decision. So that's why the enemy tries to get us in any other seat but that one. This seat over here can sometimes be fear or anxiety or stress or depression or whatever it might be. The enemy's going to try to get you in that seat. And if he can't get you in this seat, guess what seat he's going to get you in? Pride. That's the only name for this seat, pride. It doesn't get any other. That seat gets any name that you want to give it. But this seat is the seat of pride. The enemy wants to get you out of this. You you know, you think your kid's going crazy and acting all nuts is because they just hate you. (laughs) No, it's because the enemy's trying to manipulate you and get you out of a place of peace so that you cannot make the right decision. Would you let the Holy Spirit give you the peace you need today? See, Jesus came as a baby. With the coming of Jesus came the arrival of peace. But not just any kind of peace. Peace with God and the peace of God. With, I would say this. With the baby Jesus came the arrival of peace with God, the potential. With the arrival of the Holy Spirit, when he sent the Holy Spirit, came the arrival of peace of God.